May 27th, 1936. The RMS Queen Mary has departed Southampton on her maiden voyage. Aboard her are 1,849 passengers and 1,100 crew. The cream of society has sought desperately to board this ship for the special occasion, and as the ship's turbines are run up to full power for the first time in her service career, Queen Mary's bow slices through the water like a knife through hot butter. The question on everybody's mind is this, will the ship beat the Normandy? Just one year earlier, France's new superliner had taken the honorific blue ribbon by beating the Italian liner Rex's speed record in carrying out the fastest transatlantic crossing, reaching New York from Southampton in just four days and three hours. Britain had to answer this challenge and it would be the Queen Mary that would try it. But could she beat the French liner? Would the engines be powerful enough to pull it off? What design features of the two ships set them apart? The world held its breath and watched the start of one of the greatest shipping rivalries of all time. This epic story has its start in the time just after the First World War. As always, wartime had been a proving ground for new technologies. Before the war, many passenger ships had been built with triple expansion steam engines. These beasts comprised towering pistons driven by steam, but they were mechanically complex and could only achieve moderate speeds. The turbine had been introduced and adopted by many shipping companies before the war as a replacement. It was immensely powerful, relatively compact, and could achieve enormous speeds. The war had proved the turbine's dominance. Battleships, cruisers, and destroyers had travelled great distances at high speeds powered by turbines. They would be the way of the future. At the same time as this heady technological era when the sky was no longer the limit, the victorious Allied powers, France, Britain, and America, were riding a surge of patriotic nationalism at home. Britain and America had incurred huge shipping losses and were awarded three of the most modern ships built by Germany, Imperator, Vaterland, and Bismarck, which were also by far the largest ships afloat. By contrast, France was left with an aging ocean liner fleet. Compagnie Générale Transatlantique, also known as the French Line, had lost 30 ships in the conflict and rushed to replace them with some clapped out freighters. They were not awarded one of Germany's superliners, but three small freighters and another three smaller steamships. The country that had lost 1,700,000 dead, almost 5% of their entire population, was left to pick up the pieces themselves, and French Line had grand plans. The early 20s saw the company planning and building a series of increasingly impressive ships. First was the SS Paris of 1921, the new flagship. She was not the largest or the fastest ship in the world, French Line was not in a position to challenge those titles, but she was magnificently appointed and finally built. This set a pattern for the line and they applied this formula throughout the decade to their other liners, the de Grassi in 1924 and the vaunted Ile de France in 1927. By contrast, Britain's major passenger carriers like Cunard and White Star were still relying heavily on their famed pre-war fleet as well as the newer German additions. Cunard had Mauritania, Aquitania and Berengaria, a trio of liners totaling some 130,000 odd tons of shipping, while White Star Line boasted the largest trio of ships by tonnage in the world and 137,551 gross registered tons, the Olympic, the Homeric and Majestic, the largest ship in the world. These were transatlantic heavyweights and the ships were household names, almost every one a legend in their own right. French Line's offering was extremely modest by comparison. But if the company was to compete on the world stage, they would need to build a ship the likes of which had never yet been seen. She would have to be the largest and fastest ship in the world. From the ruin of wartime, French Line's fleet of humble liners had proved profitable. By the end of the 1920s, the company was well placed to challenge the British competition and plans were laid for France's own superliner. At first, she was called only T6 and the hull that began to form on the Chantier Atlantique slipway at saint nazaire France would have looked totally alien because of its bizarre shape. The hull's flared curves and strange shape was the brainchild of a Russian émigré, Vladimir Yorkovich. The engineer had started out working in Russia on dreadnought battleships for the Navy after the Russians lost their fleet in the infamous 1905 Battle of Tsushima. During this time, Yorkovich seized upon hydrodynamics and how water impacts ships as they sail through it. Ship's hulls below the waterline until then had been nice and streamlined, but there was a limit to how streamlined they could be. The ship's bow needs to have enough mass so as to be buoyant enough in heavy seas and actually float. 
Streamline the hull beneath the water enough and it would cut through the ocean like a knife, but the ship would be dangerously unstable, prone to pitching up and down and easily submerged in heavy seas. Yorkovich sought to solve this by providing a broader midship section and exaggerated tumble home, where the hull gets progressively wider as it reaches the waterline. By the 1920s, he was living and working in France, a fitter and a turner at the Renault car factory, but everything changed when he was taken on as a draftsman at Chantier Atlantique shipyard. When he found out the French line was working on initial plans for a superliner, he approached them with his hull design. The company was at first skeptical, but he received backing from a Russian-French admiral, and the company agreed to test his hull with models in a tank in Germany. The results were fascinating. His hull design was capable of achieving high speeds with 20% less power than a more traditional design. His concept was formally adopted in 1929, and France's new liner would feature this radical new hull form. Here's how it was supposed to work. For a ship designed for speed, the enemy is always drag. Drag can come in three major forms, below the waterline, at the waterline, and above it. Below the waterline, the ship's massive hull has to push through the ocean at a rate of knots, so the hull form has to be sleek and streamlined to make this as easy as possible. Meanwhile, at the waterline, the ship experiences the destructive interference of waves. The bow itself creates a wave which breaks along the side of the ship, creating drag and slowing it down. Then, the very shape of the ship's hull and superstructure above the waterline is moved through the air at speed and creates aerial drag. Everything must be made as efficient as possible if the superliner is going to be able to beat the standing speed record. One single knot, or 1.15 miles per hour, could make all the difference. To solve for the first of the three main drag creators, Yorkovich provided the new ship with a knife-edge bow of extremely thin profile. Normally, this would of course lessen the ship's buoyancy, but to account for it, the ship's hull featured an enormous midsection. Normandy boasted an extremely long and fine bow below the waterline that suddenly flared out to its full amidships width. As well as this, the bow above the waterline flared out and up, providing more mass and ensuring the ship would not be at danger of pitching dangerously up and down. By contrast, the Mauritania, a ship which had long held the transatlantic speed record, featured a conventional hull design with no flare and a prow, or very front, which was almost perfectly straight. With so little mass at her bow, the ship was known as a pitcher and would often alarmingly drop straight down and seemingly at random, even in relatively calm seas. This new French ship, by contrast, would provide a smooth ride, and the wide midsection would reduce rolling from side to side as well. Next, Yorkovich solved the wave problem as well. The new ship's hull featured a bulbous bow. Conventional ship's bows carved their way through the ocean and threw up enormous waves as they did it, which broke along the ship's side and slowed them down. The French liner's bulbous bow would act ahead of the ship's prow, disrupting the flow of water and cancelling out the bow wave, thus reducing drag. Even at full speed, Normandy would create only the tiniest of bow waves as it glided through the water. Last, there was the above water drag. Normandy's superstructure, which was extremely long thanks to the ship's huge midsection, some 734 feet, or over 70% of the ship's length, was dramatically curved at the front end, and the funnels, instead of being cylindrical, were constructed in a teardrop shape to better channel air as it flowed past. The third funnel, a dummy of sorts because it wasn't connected to the boiler uptakes, was so placed to disrupt the flow of air and more efficiently displace it along the ship's massive length. Every aspect of the ship's layout worked in conjunction to provide greater efficiency, and there was good reason for it. Britain and America's shipyards had output some of the most modern ships afloat, and as long-time adopters of the steam turbine, they had simply perfected the art. British and American steam turbines were easily the most powerful and effective afloat, and French line may not have felt fully confident in challenging this dominance. A more radical propulsion method was chosen. The new ship would be turbo-electric, with steam turbines creating electricity for motors, which would then drive the ship's propellers. The system allowed for full power to be used in reverse, without the need for dedicated astern turbines or complex and delicate gearing, and it was quieter and more easily maintained. Instead of relying on brute horsepower, the new ship's sleek hull would mean less power would be needed to break the speed record. What French Line introduced to much fanfare in 1935 was easily the world's largest ship. White Star Line's RMS Majestic was a 56,000 ton steamer, but the new French ship dwarfed her at almost 80,000 gross registered tons. The ship was essentially a floating palace, kitted out with the latest Art Deco interiors and the very finest fittings French craftsmanship had to offer. 
Early on, her construction, heavily subsidised by the government, had been a huge source of contention in France, but now, as this new superliner proudly steamed out on her maiden voyage, with the tricolour fluttering in the breeze, it all seemed worthwhile. She was named Normandy, the largest ship in the world to be sure, but would she be the fastest? Departing Southampton, Normandy's engines were gradually worked up to full speed, and her hull barely made a ripple as it sliced through the waves. From the outside, the ship looked incredibly elegant, but deep down, there were actually problems. The ship's stern section vibrated badly, even at half power, and the cause was as yet a mystery. And then, on the first day, a condenser tube ruptured and drained the ship of 25% of her power while works were carried out. But despite this, Normandy recorded more and more miles every day. On day two, it was 718 miles, but by day four, it was 754. The ship's passengers and crew were sure they'd broken the speed record and won the symbolic blue ribbon, and on June 2nd, the passengers dressed in blue, and a 98-foot-long blue banner was flown from the mast. Normandy glided into New York Harbour only four days, three hours and two minutes since passing Bishop's Rock at an average speed of 29.98 knots. She'd done it, France had won the blue ribbon, and Normandy was the largest and fastest ship in the world. For the Cunard line, this French victory was a bit of a blow. From the outset, their proposed new pair of superliners, what would eventually become the Queen Mary and the Queen Elizabeth, were intended to be the largest and fastest ships on the transatlantic trade. Traditionally, the route was serviced by trios because it made the most sense. Think of it a little like a bus route. In order to offer the most reliable and regular passenger service, three ships work best. Sailing at 20 to 25 knots on average, the ships could make decent time. And with three liners, one ship could be sailing west to America, another sailing east to Europe, and a third crossing in either direction or in for repair with no major impact on the schedule. Cunard wanted to shake this up and replace the three large ships they already operated with two larger, faster ships that would be big and quick enough to maintain a regular service on their own. The design philosophy behind the pair was outlined by Cunard chairman Percy Bates, who said that the speed is dictated by the time necessary to perform the journey at all seasons of the year and in both directions plus the consideration of the number of hours required in port on each side of the Atlantic. The size is dictated by the necessity to make money by providing sufficient saleable passenger accommodation to pay for the speed. So in this way, the speed drove the ship's size. But from the outside, making the largest and fastest ships in the world wasn't just good PR for Cunard. Bates said that instead of just competing for size and speed for the sake of it, the two new ships would really be the smallest and slowest which can fulfil properly all the essential economic conditions. But this was a little disingenuous. The British government was backing the construction of the Queen Mary and had saved it from cancellation during the Great Depression. The expectation was that the new ship would maintain Britain's dominance over the transatlantic trade, and all eyes were on the John Brown shipyard where, as Normandy made its record-breaking dash across the Atlantic, the Queen Mary was being finalised. From the outside, the differences between Queen Mary and Normandy are stark. Normandy bears little resemblance to the ships that came before her. Queen Mary, on the other hand, deliberately borrowed and expanded upon design cues from older ships like the Mauritania, like the very front of the bridge here. On top of this, where Normandy's decks were clean and open, with most of the big fans and ventilators obscured behind panelling or in the funnels, Queen Mary's decks were cluttered full of huge air vents and equipment in the tradition of older Cunard liners like the Aquitania. Cunard was not in the business of reinventing the wheel or breaking with tradition, so when it came to Queen Mary, very few radical decisions were made. This was most evident in the hull design. Queen Mary would not have a bulbous bow and her lines would be long and traditional. Where Normandy featured a sweeping, superfine bow profile beneath the waterline, Queen Mary's was comparatively thicker. The Mary's hull was sleek and streamlined to be sure, and it had actually been tested with 22 models in water tanks over the course of 8,000 tests. The bow flared out and featured a prominent rake, which meant pitching up and down would be minimalized, but at sea trials, the ship threw up an enormous bow wave almost the height of a three or four story building at full speed, meaning the hull form lacked the refined efficiency of the Normandy. In fact, it was down in the engine room where Queen Mary's trump card lay. Normandy's turboelectric engines were novel and fairly advanced and output around 160,000 horsepower in total, but Queen Mary was fitted with four massive Parsons turbines tried and tested and capable of putting out some 212,000 shaft horsepower, the equivalent of seven million rowers. The arrangement required an enormous powertrain comprising four primary boiler rooms, each containing six massive Yarrow boilers for the propulsion, an auxiliary boiler room with three Scotch boilers to generate electrical power for the ship's services, 
two turbo generator rooms, and then the two engine rooms. This power plant consumed the majority of the space of the bottom four or five decks of the ship for its entire 1,019 foot length. In May 1936, Queen Mary was ready at last for her maiden voyage. Sea trials had proved promising and the ship hit in excess of 32 knots, but the question still remained. Could Queen Mary beat Normandy's speed? Unfortunately, the maiden voyage would not provide the answer. Initially running at a decent speed, the Mary encountered fog on the final day of the crossing and she reached New York only two hours behind Normandy's record. Queen Mary had not decisively crushed the French ship's speed on her inaugural crossing, but even in the face of fog-induced delays, she had come dangerously close. French line was sweating. Despite the fact it had been such a close-run thing, there was an air of gloom around Mary's inability to beat Normandy on that first crossing. Cunard swore that they had not even been trying to do so, but even then the pressure was on. The Mary's monstrous turbines were worked up to full speed again in August 1936 for another crossing, and the Normandy's record was finally beaten by 2 hours and 35 minutes. The French Line's directors were dejected, but they would not give up hope. One of the greatest maritime rivalries of all time had begun, and the margin of victory, just over 2 hours, was very slim. Improvements were made to Normandy throughout the winter of 1936 to 1937, with boiler efficiency increased and a new set of four-bladed propellers fitted to the ship instead of her older three-bladed ones. And the result was impressive. Normandy beat Queen Mary's time in May 1937, crossing the Atlantic in just three days and 23 minutes. Her engines pushed to output power very close to Queen Mary's turbines. On the return voyage, Normandy's turboelectric engines actually output 195,850 developed horsepower on the final day. Clearly, the improvements had worked. Normandy once again held the blue ribbons, but Cunard and Queen Mary had an answer. See, Normandy was not the only ship to receive modifications to help her speed along. A set of four 18-foot wide manganese bronze propellers were crafted for the ship, more efficient than her original set. And in August 1938, Queen Mary's crew again pushed her engines to full power and the ship ended Normandy's reign, cruising into New York over two hours earlier than the French ship's fastest time. Normandy's skipper sent a message through. Bravo to the Queen Mary, until next time. But there would be no next time. This rivalry could have gone on for years because again, the margin for Queen Mary's victory was so slim. But then in September 1939, just a year after Queen Mary's win, everything changed. While Britain and France's superliners had duelled on the Atlantic, Nazi Germany had plunged Europe into fear by expanding into neighbouring territories and annexing Czechoslovakia and Austria. War seemed a grim inevitability, and transatlantic trips on the Normandy and the Queen Mary were savoured as if to be a little escape from reality. On August 23, 1939, Normandy left Le Havre on a regular, scheduled crossing, but she would never return. On September 1st, war broke out when Hitler's armies invaded Poland, and the frivolous peacetime transatlantic rivalries between France and Britain were ended. In 1940, French and British soldiers fought and died side by side when the German army swept into France, and with the country's occupation, Normandy became a refugee ship without a home. Mothballed in New York Harbour for years, the ship was requisitioned by the US Navy for conversion into a troop ship, but it was completely bungled. A fire broke out in 1942, and the ship capsized. By contrast, Queen Mary's immense speed was to play a vital role in her wartime career, and it was her greatest asset. Alongside her new sister ship, Queen Elizabeth, the great speed that Cunard Chairman Percy Bates had considered crucial in maintaining a regular peacetime transatlantic schedule would now see the two sister ships become some of the most highly valued Allied troop transports of the war and the most sought-after target of Hitler's navy. Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, like and subscribe to the channel. Every bit helps, and I put out a new video every week, so you'd hate to miss out. If you'd like to support my work, please subscribe to me on Patreon, or you can sign up for a YouTube membership for perks like early access, behind the scenes, and many more. You'll find the link in the description below. As always, stay safe, stay happy, and I'll see you again next time.